Uh, you know, and as Gradius has been able to educate its listeners and its followers about the world, the way it works. As a man, if I have knowledge, it's my job to share that knowledge. I can't share what I don't have, you know what I'm saying? So if I have knowledge, if I know something, it's my job as a, as a man to, sh to share it, whether I'm an artist, a musician, a teacher, a garbage man, whatever. You know, you have a responsibility for the knowledge that you have. And, um, but I don't, because I make the type of music that I make, people think that I expect every artist to make that type of music. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I don't. Um, I make the type of music based on what I know how to make. Uh, you know, and, and, and if I were to try to do something else, it wouldn't come, up, come across as genuine. You know, but I don't put the burden of that on the art. I put it on myself as a man. And as far as in Christian hip hop, uh, there is a whole gang of rappers. There's thousands of them that are committed to sharing their knowledge, which is knowledge of, uh, of Christ and their faith in Christ uh, over the same thing, beats that are jamming. And, um, and I think that there's an emerging uh, genre, although our goal is not to create a subgenre. You know, we are hip hop, part of the culture. We grew up in it. We, you know, I grew up listening to UGK, Ghetto Boys. I mean, all the rap a lot stuff. I just loved it from Raheem back in the days. I, I was in this whole stuff. All this was inbred at me, and and there was a decision I made at 18 years old that changed my life, and therefore the course of who I was changed. No longer was I regurgitating the music I was listening to. I was regurgitating the scriptures I was reading, and. I knew no other way. I wanted to be real. I wanted to be true to who I was. And so, uh, like he said, I would never put my principles, my morals, my standards, and expect someone to be right there because there was 18 years of my life where I wasn't there. And so everybody, you know, comes to that in their own time. Um, uh, to name some artists, of course, you got Reach Records. Uh, they've been the most successful Christian hip hop record label today. The guys get uh, enormous. That experience is what got me well, man. That's incredible. Lupe, we, we all know you in hip hop as a man of your morals. You even went so far as to stand up to the powers that be because of the way you felt about your music. Can you talk about that for a little bit and how strongly you felt you had to stand on your morals um, against your label? Um, Without, you know, putting yourself in a funny position. Oh, uh, that's cool. Um, you, you know, I'm all, I, I hate injustice, you know, and I hate dishonesty, you know, and I, like, like Talib said, I demand honesty, you know, even if it's, you know, I have a saying why I say I trust everybody to be human, you know, and I accept that. So humans are capable of the most beautiful things and they're capable of the most destructive things, but just keep it honest with me, you know, because I, I respect that because we all humans, ain't nothing else. Um, and so for me, when I, when, I, when I peer into a situation, I'll become aware of a situation that is dubious, you know, and diabolical, you know, downright nasty, you know, uh, sink or swim for me, you know, fail or succeed for me, I'm gonna fight it. You know, I'm gonna stand up for it, whether, no matter who it be, whether it be, I didn't shake Barack Obama's hand. Everybody, you didn't shake his hand, like, no. You know, because I don't believe in some of the things that he's about to do. You know, in the same way, I'm not finna kowtow to my record company. You know, it's, it's, it, if, if, if you want me to be the commercial artist, then just say that. You know, if you want me to be, and I hate that we swerve in this into something else, but I guess it has a purpose and a point. Oh, no, um, you know, if you want me to be this particular artist, then just tell me that. You know, and I'll do that for you. That's what I do, I'm an artist. You know, and I'm gonna do it in my own way. You know, I'm gonna keep it honest so it's true to me but I'm gonna give you what you need, because at the end of the day, it's music. We can, we can make whatever we want. You know, you got Trey remaking Kings of Leon songs, you know? Um, so everybody's capable as a musician, as an artist, to just fill any mold. But let's keep it, keep it honest with me. Let me know that you want to do that. Don't put me in a situation where I gotta find out about it two weeks later that this producer was actually signed to you, and this writer's like, you're getting published, you get more publishing from the song than I am. Wow. Yeah. So when that goes out, you have people you know, my fans, probably a few of them out there. I know it's definitely one from Houston that flew all the way to New York um, for a protest. You know, so you have people when they see injustice, 
you know, they act upon it, whether it be in a petition or a protest or on a Twitter or, you know, rampage in the building with phone calls and, and, and things. Um, to people, was this just the, as they say, the straw that broke the camel's back? Um, yeah, this mic is hot. <laughs> this mic is real hot. Uh, you know, actually, when everything happened with, with uh, our entourage and my manager, I kind of felt, you know, well, there was a lot of hurt and a lot of pain behind what had happened. But it happened right at a, at a time where this is what I was going to do anyway. So when that happened, I knew a lot of people were going to think, oh, he did this because, or he changed his ways or his views because of what happened to my manager. But no, actually, the truth of the matter is, I warned everybody. And you can ask them to this day. When I sit there and I talk to him, he tells me, he said, you told me this was going to happen, didn't you? You know, because I did. I told everybody. Like, I saw it getting stupid. I saw it getting stupid. And I, and I always, in my crew, I was the one with, um, you know, the one who, who, who thought a, a little bit more, dug a little bit deeper. And I could tell, you know, when, when things were just going astray. So, um, you know, basically, I, I just seen it coming. I seen it, uh, you know, ahead of time. And, and, and just tried to let them know. Um, but these are definitely my, my views and, and how I have felt through most of my time in hip-hop, um, a, a, a lot of times, I really didn't feel at home. I did everything I wanted to do, had all the fun that I wanted to have, you know, and, and just about uh, pleasing myself and doing, you know, whatever made Gene happy. But at the same time, something was telling me, like, you know, this isn't right, the way I was living, or the things that I was doing. So it just came to a breaking point, like you say, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And um, just had to come clean it and just be real with myself. And, you know, I got to sleep with myself at night. And I, I look at myself in the mirror and I just, I got to live with myself. So I just wanted to come clean and, um, you know, just, just share what was on, on my heart. That's real. Just on the surface, if you count the similarities in everybody on this panel and um, count the differences, the similarities far outweigh the differences. But the differences is, is what people focus on sometimes too much, you know what I'm saying? Um, we all grew up listening to hip hop and our hip hop that we listen to is based on something emotional and based on something regional. It's based on where you grew up at and what you went through in your life. And that determined what type of music you might listen to or what you might make at the end of the day. Um, now as far as conscious hip hop versus any other type of hip-hop, I mean, you know, it's easier to sell something if you label it, but it's, it's, it's the responsibility of the fans and the artists to see through that and see beyond that, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I always try to reach out and do songs with, you know, artists like Bun B, you know what I'm saying? Like, I try to reach out and do songs with different, with all, t all different types. So I get flack all the time, man. I, like, um, I get flack, I did a song with, with Gucci Man, I did a song with Bow Wow, you know what I'm saying? But I also do songs with MF Doom and Gene Gray, you know what I'm saying? So I do songs with just artists, period. Um, I think the, the people who don't do music or don't live a, a lifestyle like this sometimes don't understand the process and how similar the process is for, for artists and why artists might, might get together and work. And, um, and I think when you don't understand the process, you romanticize it, and 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 you make it you you it, it becomes a part of your, your your psyche, and you have a relationship with it where you feel like you owe something. Um, but you know, music is an even exchange. Um, we make it, you know, we sell it. You could buy it. If you don't like it, you can sell it back to the store. You know what I'm saying? Or you can give it give it away or something, or you can download it or whatever. But um. You know, I think it's, it's, it's really about, about personal responsibility. I, I, when I set out to make music, I didn't set out to make conscious hip hop. Um, I set out to want to rap and be a rap star when I was 13 years old, you know what I'm saying? And I just rapped about what I knew about. Trey, we, if, let's say if the divide between the conscious rapper and the street rapper is an inch wide, then the divide by perception between the secular artists and the Christian or religious artists would maybe be a foot wide. Um, but every time something is going on in the inner city, I see you and then I also see Trey. Um, do 
do you get a sense that is it the is it our audience is it the street audience not willing to to recognize what it is that the christian audience is doing or is it vice versa where does that divide come from is that or is that a reflection of society in general i definitely know most most christian hip-hop MCs had a conversion moment before that they the majority were listening to mainstream uh, hip-hop and so um i think we fully understand uh and and distinguish uh the difference between the two christian hip-hop because it's been labeled that and if, if you don't understand why a lot of people are like why you labeled it like well we didn't want to do that but you got to understand when we started the church was saying you can't have that in the church that's devil music just like they did rock and go down the line they've always rejected something new in music and so um, it took time for us to say, no, 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 we're not what you see on TV. We're not what you hear on the radio. We're Christians doing hip hop. We're Christian rappers. And we had to say that so long. So pastors and youth pastors would allow us to come and speak to their kids. Has a community center. So while these churches have gates around them, um, he's open and, kid, and, and young people are able to come play, play basketball, get in boxing programs. Uh, be a part of hip hop hope what we do and eventually hopefully you know take advantage of computer learning classes and stuff like that I think Christian hip-hop will be more accepted as we Christian hip-hop Missionaries go out and serve the community to where you can't deny that we back what we say in our music we live it Then I think it'll be accepted by mainstream audiences That's right Trey, you're an artist that I think a lot of people know um, you know, you are identified with the hood, with the inner city. Um, and there's there's a perception that if you keep it too real with the hood, that you can't um, achieve success commercially, or that if you achieve too much commercial success, that you've not kept it real with the hood. How have you made that balance between, you know, finding success with your music, but still maintaining, you know, your connection with the inner city in a real way, not just quote, as we love to say in hip hop, keeping it real. I think, I think basically from just doing me, I mean, for those who said I can never jump to, to touch with commercial artists, I did it with everybody from Wyclef to Nicole Rayleigh to all kinds. And then as far as within the streets itself, I think I'm accepted really by all all certain genres because within the hood, no matter how much commercial music I decide to do or what I decide to do, I'm always there for them. And I think a, a lot of people, where they get it confused is a, it's a lot of people that, which at the end of the day, I look like no, nobody owes nobody anything. So a lot of people choose to, to get their break and some decide not to come back. They're not required to come. But I think the reason that I'm also accepted is at the same time, you may see me spinning on MTV six, seven times a day. You come right to that corner store and see me right there with some of the little homies laughing and joking and playing. And, uh, you know, I think with me, I just, first and foremost, I know it has something to do with the big homie up above, but I'm just accepted in different, in different ways because with me, they never look at me like when I go to do commercial music, anything in the hood be proud, like, man, you getting it for us, you know what I'm saying? So I don't really have to experience what, what others may, I guess, because I just stay true to myself. I just do me, like I ain't worried about what the next person say. And I mean, you know, you have been in the trenches right there with me while I've been labeled the worst, but I'm gonna keep it moving, you know, like like right now, I ain't, I've yet to fold, and I don't plan on it no time soon. That's right. Lou, um. You're morally, you stood your ground to the point where you felt the need to write a song that I've been listening to a lot lately. It's called Words I Never Said. Um, to where, you know, a person is kind of showing regret over all the things that they're thinking that they've been scared to say. And it's, it touches on a lot of very real and raw issues. In the course of recording this record, knowing that there would be somewhat of a backlash about it, how intent were you on making sure that that album, one, made the album, that song, one, made the album, but two, also made it out to the masses as well? Um, Ninja Magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, the, the honest part of it, and I was, I was waiting on this, 
I mean, we talked about it the other day. There was only a few pieces of backlash with you know particular TV shows didn't want me to perform that record on that show for various reasons. But in general, I haven't got any negative backlash from anybody. You know, from whether it be Tea Party activists or you know the Democratic whoever or you know the preacher man or the dope man or whoever, because um, everybody everybody says like they give me thumbs up. They're like, yeah, you know, we believe that too. And it's a, it was a little kid from from here from Houston, was 11 years old, who actually remade the song. You know, really, yeah, and, and put it up like you know, I, I felt the same way about that political thing. I just didn't know how to say it because I was 11. But thanks, you know. <laughs> um, so it's, you, you'd be surprised when you, it's the truth. You know, you'd be surprised how many people actually relate to it. And some people may, well, it may be a conspiracy theory, it may be this, but it's like, no. You know, you see, you see it out there in the world. You see what's going on. You can put two and two together. Um, I never underestimated, you know, the, the masses' ability to, to see through you know, just the CNN news blurb, or the, the, the quote unquote expert, you know, speaking in big terms um, and thinking that it's going over to people's heads. You know, like people understand that. You know, I, I, I don't, I never, you know, I never, I never dumb it down with my audience. You know, I never dumb it down with my, with, with, with my songs where I'm trying to tell you something. You know, if I'm just trying to make you dance, then we just gonna dance. You know, but if I'm trying to tell you the truth, I'm gonna keep it raw and educated and intellectual because I know that the world understands that. You know, from the little kid all the way up. You know, and they're gonna react to it and and, and feel a ways about it and have a critique and commentary um, and, and so on and so forth from what it does. So it was really surprising, you know, that I didn't get the backlash. And then to get it out through the label, which is even more surprising. You know, the, the, the same people that you would think would want to keep these things at bay. And this is, this is kind of a, a contrary to, to what Trey was saying earlier um, about the, the, the corporate forces and the pressure, right? They'll put out whatever it is they think is going to sell, you know? So if they think booty shaking is going to sell, then they're going to put out booty shake. If they think that, you know, you know, talking about the benevolence of the high and mighty you know, Marxist movement, whatever, you know, they're gonna put that out if they think that that's gonna sell. Um, but one thing I noticed with that record in particular was all of the label reps, the radio people, the, the program directors, everybody was like, yo, that's dope. We ain't gonna play it. <laughs> you know, but we agree with you. And I sit down and have discourse with, with program directors about the song, we'll take a little piece of it. And it, it was just really surprising to see that the label as far as the message that was behind it, not only supported it, but agreed with it. Because I think the perception is that the labels are afraid of when an artist takes a political stance sometimes. But in this case, you can see. Oh, they called the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> they did call, that's one thing that did came out. They, before, as it was like, hey, this is dope, and we like what you're saying, they had a team of lawyers fact-checking every line, making sure that they wouldn't be liable for it. Wow. Yeah, so, but you know, it is what it is. Now, Malice, at this current state of your career now, um, where you feel more obligated to speak um, to certain truths other than other situations now, how has that gone over, you know, with your brother, with your crew, um, record company? How has this whole new you gone over, this new obligated Gene Thornton? <laughs> how, has that, how has that gone over? Listen, man, um, I'm the big brother, you know, so it, it don't matter. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, you know. <laughs> Um, I had a, a life-changing experience, and uh, Jesus Christ definitely saved my life. So when that happens, you know, you can't deny it. Um, you know, in, in, in the industry and, and um, you know, uh, being, in, being in this music game, and, and it, it's a great thing, but if you don't have the discipline, and I, I thought I had a lot of discipline, you know, but um, you could get caught up in a whirlwind, and I can honestly say that this whirlwind definitely tried to kill me and take me out of here, definitely. And Jesus definitely saved my life, so I know he saved my life, so I have to give him all the glory. So it doesn't matter to me what uh, anybody thinks. Um, fortunately, you know, my brother loves everything that I'm doing. You know, he tells me that he appreciates, you know, what I'm doing, and, and uh, he definitely has my back, you know, and I have his back as well. 
uh, Rhea Gang, you know, they call me, they tell me, you know, that Lava tells me all the time that he really respects what I'm doing. So, um, you know, I, I definitely have a lot of support. Definitely. Absolutely. Kwali, um, again, and I hate to keep using this word, this term, conscious, as a conscious artist, um, you speak to the truths of the reality as you see them in, in Brooklyn. You also have artists on your label, Strong Arm Steady. Strong Arm Steady are from Los Angeles, and they speak to, I guess they would do closer to more street music, like Trey the Truth said. How did you come about meeting such a, a street-oriented group and bringing them into your fold? Of, and how do you think that you do within the, the Christian music society, whereas some people are maybe line walkers, or you know, are some are some people too secular for Christian rap, or you know, how does that work within your community? Because the same way we we would assume that Kwali would have more in common with say a Pharaoh March than a Trader Truth, does that exist within Christian music as well? Are some people more dedicated to the word as opposed to the craft? Yeah, I mean, we have the same. Um, you know, group of people who are who have shortcomings in their lives, they fall short. Some are in stages of their life where, you know, they might have just given their life to Christ, but they still want to rap, they still want to pursue um, the street, you know, reaching the streets. And so you'll have rappers within our genre that might boast about their rims, boast about making money. And, you know, according to the scripture, um, you know, the word would stand against any form of pride, arrogance, boasting, and self. And so we have artists that will, will, will walk that line. And, you know, it's to each his own. Some people love an artist like that because it's a breath of fresh air from the other rapper who's Christian and everything is so theological that it's, it's almost like another world. Um, and so we'll have artists that may be... Um, battle rap type artists that will boast in their skills and challenge MCs and things like that. Once again, they're walking a fine line with acceptance amongst um, the, 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 the Christian population. Although, the same Christians that would challenge that would, you know, buy a mainstream record and not have a problem with it. It's weird. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say that a lot of people, when they, when they decide they're going to start rapping for the Lord, they'll, they eventually grow into a level of maturity where they don't want to walk that line, they don't want to get close to it, and, um, and if they don't, they usually will go back to making mainstream music and abandon, abandon any form of Christian content. And uh, the most successful Christian MCs do not walk that line. The most successful Christian MCs, they keep it far away from that line. And they keep it straight scripture and um, not really relational to the street type music because they have a church audience of youth groups from white to black, Hispanic, Asian that consume their music um, because their youth pastors know it's safe. We still have yet to arrive at a point where a street type of Christian hip hop MC is accepted amongst the church in a way where he can really sell some units and, and make a living doing this. And is that more of a reflection of society or, 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 or is that basically just because of the fact that it's labeled as rap music? Um, I think uh, it's a reflection of, yeah, probably a reflection of society and how diverse we are and how um, we, we all live our lives sometimes behind a mask, you know, and there's no way that I can throw stones at anybody because I fall short. So, you know, when I see a rapper walk that line, it's like, you know, give him some grace, give him some time, talk to him, spend some time with him, you know, get to know him. I have an artist, y'all met him in the classroom, Vaughn Vaughn. Oh, Vaughn pushes the limits all the time. He's pushing the limits. But you know what? Vaughn will go anywhere and he will share his amazing testimony of being saved from a life of drugs, alcohol, women, just you know, a, 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 a thug lifestyle. And, and I will watch people respond and change their lives. I will watch youth turn around and, 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 and denounce their gangs and uh, people get delivered of drugs. He'll walk in the middle. Uh, we go to Brazil and, and go to a place called Cracolangia. Walk in the middle and um, start rapping for people and they crowd around and then we tell them about 
the love of Jesus and how it changed our lives. And so I, why would I have a problem with him? And then I'll see another rapper who's very theological in his raps fall to a, a sin, whether it's adultery or maybe he's a compulsive liar. We're all, we're all screwed up. You know, we're, we're just all jacked up and we're in need of some help. And so we got to allow grace for one another. I hope that answers your question. Oh, absolutely. Trey, Trey, I want to talk to you right now about the G code. In, in the streets, we always hear the G code brought up. And in the streets, I think most people who would know see that as its own set of morals and ethics in the street. How much does the G code, you know, this quote G code, come into play when you make your musical decisions as well as your day to day life decisions? I mean, most definitely, you know, with, with, with them, all type of music that I do and others do just like me. You know, it, it, it's certain stuff. It's kind of certain stuff you really, you just, it, it really just ain't G. I mean, that's, that's just what they is. I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory. But uh, it's kind of hard for me to, I would say it'd be hard for me to speak on it for two reasons. One, I, I've always told myself, never worry about what the next man doing. And two, to this day I've yet to break the G code, so I haven't really experienced, <laughs> I ain't experienced that, no, that asking, part of it. I'm not asking you to give away no, you know, rules <laughs> in the street, but, but we hear the term thrown around a lot, you know, specifically in Houston, you know what I'm saying? We always hear the term about the G code. And, you know, it's, like I said, it's, it's the hood's own set of morals and standards and ethics that people feel the need to live by um, according to the world that they exist in. You're a person that has been able to exist within this hood world and outside of it. How much does the G code come into play when you leave the world of, the, of these G's? Uh, I, I mean, with me, I'm a kind of combine the, the G code and the keeping the real thing. When, with that being said, you know, a lot of what a lot of people don't understand, uh, nine times out of ten in this day and age, everybody's definition of G and keeping it real ain't what the real definition of it is in the first place. I mean, you know, coming up how we came, coming up how we came up, you know, like for instance, at, at, at the second annual trade day, it was a shoot, you know, uh, it, it was kids out there, you know, some, one of my closest people, mama got shot out there. So I mean, quote unquote, you would think keeping it real is let it blow over, you know what I'm saying? But at the same token, that wasn't gangsta at all because any real teams out there don't rock like that, you know what I'm saying? So I think I think a lot of that stuff comes just nowadays to those who don't really, who don't live the street life, I'ma help you. You get a lot of, a lot of our partners who pay Maybe be partners, might not be partners, come on from prison or other places, come from other territories, and they come gas these stories up and, and plant these seeds in people here to make them start believing this is what's real and this is what's G. When all the while they never knew what was G and what was real from the beginning. So now it's just all mixed up, you know what I'm saying? So with, within just this day and age in hip hop, man, I, I feel that's why I stay so blunt with my music and, and kind of get to the point and be rough with it because I feel a lot of people have to kind of understand from our aspect of what we what we understood what was real. Because right now, you know, some people might think slapping a broad upside the head is real. Where I come from, we don't put hands on females, you know what I'm saying? Some people might feel stealing from your brother was gangster, you and G for that. Like, we don't do that type of stuff I came up. So I think everything just kind of all like he said, screwed up, you know what I'm saying? Not the plug that, you know, but this is what it is. Lou, you are one of the most traveled people I know. You've been all over the world. You've seen hip hop um, used in many different ways. And you spoke earlier about, you know, yeah, if, you know, if I want to make a song about dancing, then I'll make a song about that. And if I want to make a song while well, I'm telling you something, I'll do that. How do you see, you know, hip hop across the world being used as a way of people expressing themselves and trying to show people how they live. Like when you, I've heard you speak on um, Palestine and Israel recently, and I know a lot of artists from those regions. Music is their primary way of expression. 
You know what I'm saying? Have you noticed this if you travel around the world and have you been able to incorporate any of that into what you do? Has has seen people fight for what they wanted and what they needed around the world. I see the anarchy hat on your head. That that's gotta count for something. Um you know, most definitely. There's a you know, going I always say that, you know, hip hop. You know, hip hop is a is the, the cult, there's, there's a cultural side of it and there's the commercial side of it. And you, you look at it, you relate it to like an iceberg. Well, the smallest part of the iceberg, no matter how massive it may seem, is on the surface, you know. And the, the largest part of the iceberg is, is underneath the water, um, where there are no, quote unquote, I'm say there are no television cameras, there are no videos, there are no interviews taking place there. But it's hip hop, you know, and, and, and it's people expressing themselves, whether it be through MCing or breakdancing or spray painting or whatever. Um, it's people expressing themselves through this this context, this cultural context that we have today called hip hop, um, and it's just as vibrant, it's just as authentic, you know, it's just as meaningful um, as the biggest artist with a thousand songs on the radio and, and on tour all around the world. And you know, I look at it as as as, as the same level, the same playing field. Um, that's just how I look at the, the cultural forces of it. So when I go around the world and I see things like. You know, you, you go to Japan and, you know, did, no one knows any words to the songs, you know, but they're rocking, you know, which they don't know none of the words, you know, but they're rocking with you. And then vice versa, I'll see, I'll be in the crowd and it'll be a Japanese hip hop act and two turntables and a, and a microphone murdering it. And I don't know a word that they're saying, you know, but I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, the, it's the, that instant connection, the, 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 the entertainment side of it, the, the, the being able to enjoy just a good performance, um, which transcends anything. You know, that's why I can sit down and listen to, uh, you know, a, a, a punk, rock, metal, rock, crazy, screaming thing and turn around and listen, watch the ballet and appreciate just the showmanship of it. Um, across the board, the same thing that, that occurs within hip hop, traveling around in different places where they use different languages. Um, but then when you go to places where, you know, where the, the music is beyond entertainment, it becomes the voice of the struggle, you know, and you see the the, the, the Muslim rappers that come out of Palestine and and, 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 and come out of Pakistan and, and different places around the world, um, and even places like uh, Colombia and places like Brazil, and the 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 closeness of, of, of what they're saying to them, you know, the, the destruction and the violence and, and, the, and the pillaging and the raping and the injustice and, and all of those things is, is so there and it's so visceral, you know, that you, you, it, it, it can bring you to, to tears to see your art form practiced at that such, that high of a level, you know, that, that vanguard, you know, where you think back to, um, um, uh, I don't, I don't even, I'm not even going to say his name because I'm going to get brutalized up here. Um, but Broken Glass, everywhere, you know, to me that was the pinnacle of hip hop at that point. You in the Bronx, the Bronx looks like Lebanon in 86, bomb, everything is bombed out, there's the building people, you know, Ronald Reagan went through there and was like, what the hell is this? You know, and out of that you see, you know, hip hop speaking on it to a massive audience and it's close, but it's entertaining at the same time too, but I, I still go back to that particular song. As, as one of the pinnacle records of hip-hop. Hip-hop in its purest form, that communication, communicating struggle, um, communicating experience, um, communicating, you know, the morals and values and ethics and everything just in one powerful punch. So when I go to these, these third world countries and I meet these kids who come with their CDs and they come with their, you know, they're in the front rows and it, it's just so powerful to see that this is life or death and that song could get them killed. You know, at the same time, too, there's places in America where that song could get you killed as well. But their death is my martyrdom. You know, it's not just dying for nothing because you you threw a crib in this song, you dropped blood in that song. It's like, no, you, you spoke out against you know this regime when you spoke out out against this government, and they're gonna come to your house and they're gonna kick in your door and you're gonna disappear tomorrow. You know, so to see people taking hip hop and and, and using it you know, weaponizing it and, and pushing it back in the faces of, of, of the corrupt regimes of this world is a, is a beautiful thing. And I always pay homage to those dudes, you know, how they can, there's no plaque, there's no Grammy, there's nothing that you could give them, um, you know, that would, that would, I guess, suffice as an award for, for to see hip hop used like that. And do you feel Lupe is doing that here in America? With songs like words I never said? 
I'm trying, man. I'm trying my best. I, I, I wish for revolution in this country every day. Every nigga with dreads for the cause is every nigga with goals for the fall. No. So don't get caught up in appearance. You know, Absolutely. that right there is just like, let's get it. Whether you, you, you was toting guns in the street the day before, or you was working at the mission, you know, that night, like we all in this together, we all gotta, we all gotta communicate and understand each other and work beyond our barriers and, and, and the things that separate us to really change this world for the better. Yeah. Absolutely. No, you can applaud that. You can applaud that. Um, you didn't choose to use music as the outlet for expressing that. You chose to use a book. Did you feel music wasn't the right outlet, or did you feel that because of what you represented before that you thought it maybe would be too much of a you know, the slap of cold water in the face for people to go from the, the last clips first they may have heard to this new found religious convergence. Did you feel that the book was the more of a medium ground to express yourself? And will you be using your music in the future to express who you are? Yeah, um, I, I definitely use music to express who I am. Um, I had to go straight book with this. It was no time to be cute or clever or you know, try to find the, the, the second part of, you know, what rhymes and metaphor and simile this and all of that. This, I had to just tell <laughs> what happened to me, you know. Um, this wild series of undeniable events actually happened to me. And I'd be around friends and, and family members, and whatever we were talking about, I'd have to stop them in their tracks, and I'd be like, yo, wait, listen, I got to tell you what happened to me. And they would always like listen with shock and awe. And the story would take about two to three hours to tell. And everybody I'd come around, I'd, I'd just have to tell them about it. So what I did was, you know, I, for once and for all, I just put it in the book. I knew it was a story that, that had to be shared. Um, I'm on Twitter at Malice757. And if y'all would just check my timeline and see what people are actually saying about this book. This book isn't about um, me thinking that I'm creative enough to write a book. I was rapping at the time, and whatever would make me stop doing what I was doing, to take a time out, and I, and I told my brother, you know, I said, this is, you know, it's a breaking point right here. We're caught up on everything, and um, I gotta chill for a minute, and, and I have to put this message out. <clears throat> and he didn't, uh, he didn't understand at first. You know, I was actually in LA. That's when we talked in LA that time. And, uh, you know, I was trying to explain to him what had happened to me, but it just wasn't coming out right. So luckily, I just had the manuscript with me and I had I had given it to him. And, um, you know, I, put, I went, got the key to his room, I put it on his bed. And uh, he called me like six in the morning and he was like, oh, wow, this is crazy. And then I went up to his room and we talked about it. And it's, it's phenomenal what happened to me. And I'm not up here sales pitching a book promise. Like, this ain't even me. I'm not even that creative to come up with a story of this magnitude. But, um, you know, there was no time to be rapping about this. I had to just straight write it out and, and tell what happened. Man, I'm glad you did. Kwali, you're one of the people that what I've noticed in your music and, and hip hop and anyone as a Kwali fan will notice that you incorporate a lot of references to books and, uh, and literature. How important is that? Because uh, we speak about how his book it was written to change his life. And Can you speak to certain books that changed your life that you felt you had to talk about in, in, in the midst of your art form? Yeah, um, you know, everybody who, who is literate, literate loves to read. I learned that working at a bookstore. I worked at a bookstore called the Cure Books in Brooklyn. Um, me and Most Def ended up buying a bookstore um, after we put out the Black Star album. But what I used to notice about working in a bookstore was people would come in and they would bring their, their children. And it would be like, like say a woman would come and she would want, want a romance novel. And she would just be quiet, telling her kids to be quiet, but not letting them explore the bookstore. And then they was wondering, and then people wonder why the kids don't like to read. Um, I became very good at the bookstore at giving people, looking at people, and looking at what they was wearing, listening to their questions, and be like, you know, what? this is for you. This is something you should check out. Um, you know, I come from a, I come from a household of professors. My mother and my father 
both teach at college. Um, you know, which means that there was a lot of focus on education in my house, but it also means that if, if you also been paying attention to what's going on in this government, because it also means they didn't make a lot of money either, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I, I just, uh, there was a focus on education in my house. So as far as books, I mean, the first, first book that really, really opened me up and I was really able to relate to um, was the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, it was one of the first books. Um, then you have uh, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, who's a Brazilian writer. That's probably my favorite book of all time. Um, then you got, you know, I'm into biographies. Um, Iceberg Slim is a great one. You know what I'm saying? That's one of my favorites. Um, Miles Davis' biography is a great one. Um, uh, Thelonious Monk biography that just came out is a great one. Um, but you know, I try to, I, I like to read about people who are doing things and, 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 and like, that's what I focus on. I, I don't read too much, at this point, too much fiction or whatever, but um, that's where I'm at with it right now. And Trey Nine, of course, you incorporate probably one of the most important books in the world into your music, the Bible. How important is it? Um, do you feel possibly the need to incorporate scripture um, do you kind of take pattern after the Bible and use parables? Um, how important is the Bible, not just in your life? Um, but I do have ones that I intentionally, you know, uh, something's on my heart, something burdens me, I want to share it. I make sure that I incorporate it. Really, it's just like what uh, these guys are saying. It's where you're at at that time, how you feel, what's going on in the culture, what's going on in society, because I'm trying to reach people. I'm not trying to preach to a choir, although they do need preach to quite often, um, but, but I'm trying to reach people. I'm trying to relate to people, and, uh, and I can only do that from my personal perspective. I, I, can't, I can't really write a rhyme about about being a gangster, because I never was a gangster. Uh, I thought I was when I was rapping it back then. Um, <laughs> but I can not I can relate to the fact that I'm in the hood with a lot of gangsters, or I go to prisons and I meet a lot of gangsters, or some of the homeless people we serve are gangsters and rapists and murderers and all that. But, but I can only tell their story. Um, incorporating the Bible is should come from my heart. It should flow natural. I don't grab, I'm gonna do a song about loving your neighbor. Let me get all the scriptures I can on love your neighbor. Put it in a song, there it is. It's not my artistic expression. Some do that, but not me, but it is important. And Shrey, you know, we represent the hood and the inner cities where a lot of time, um, quote books, you know, reading books and that kind of stuff isn't important. Do you feel the need that to, to give certain information to certain people that you know are probably not going to go back and read this book. You can never know too much. And, and I mean, to this day, you know, me and you'll have conversations. Like, I listen closely to what people say, so I'm always learning. And so I most definitely feel within, within a sense of certain books and, and certain articles and certain situations that's going on is, is something that you have to kind of take serious and pay attention to. And to those who, who may not want to, you know, you may catch us learning about something or reading something. And then, you know, we might go to the hood or the outdoors, you know, the, the, they ain't gonna get picked nothing up. So sometimes it's more better for us just to say what's going on and them to take it from us as opposed to trying to get them to sit down and sit in their car while they maybe smoke their blunt or whatever. And, hey, we're gonna check this out real fast. You just know it ain't gonna happen. So of course, you know, it's always a good thing, like as far as from, from our standpoint, for us to be able to shed that on into your music because you have a very wide range of things that you you know you take in and stuff so how, how important is that to incorporate i mean even right now with the shirt you got on that is not is that even the shirt you get in america like what is what? well it's uh i guess we could just use this as an example uh there was a a movement called punk rock um, that, that started in, in they say it started in detroit with a black punk group called the death but that's how people punk started in london um, and it was a reaction against, you know, the the deindustrialization, the the uh, austerity programs that were put in place by the government at that time, which basically just stripped jobs away. People didn't have any money. You know, it was all the uh, if you wanted something, you had to really do it yourself. DIY, and it became a big part of the punk movement. Um, and one of the people that came up out of the punk movement was a was a, a beautiful lady. I just got the opportunity to meet a couple. 
weeks ago by the name of Vivian Westwood. Um, and she was a fashion designer. And she made all of her, she made, basically made all of her clothes in the back of the shop, you know, and went out to the front of the shop and sold them. You know, and she, she, she became known as the woman who dressed punk, who gave it the look, the same, you can relate it to baggy pants and hoodies for hip hop. Um, so it was all these crazy things and, and mismatching and, and self-expression, but her, she always had a political tone with her music, I mean, with her, with her, through her fashion. She wasn't a musician, she was a, she was a, a, a fashion designer. And, but even with that, she always put, you know, uh, rebellious rhetoric or, or the writings of Karl Marx or, or, you know, just some imagery of some sort that, 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 that shook and spoke to society at large, that spoke to what was going on, or going on around them. Um, and so she, she became known for that, you know, through, through the ages, you know, she, she, she went avant-garde and became this big success and, and what have you. Um, coming all the way up today as to why I have this shirt on. You know, I like to participate and I gravitate toward things that have meaning, you know. So if it's a particular brand that to me has no meaning, I don't wear it, you know. And if it's a brand that I think has a certain level of meaning, I wear it because the difference between, say, me wearing this, this t-shirt and just wearing a Nike t-shirt, this t-shirt came with a manifesto. And this manifesto was called Active Resistance. And it was written by Vivian Westwood, and she talked about cultural expression and art imitating life and, and art initiating life and all these grand ideals. And, and Socrates even comes up in the, in the midst of it, and Aristotle and all these different characters. And it just speaks to me to know that all that thought went into make this t-shirt. You know? And so I live my whole life like that. You know, I, I gravitate and try and surround myself with things that I can pull positive energy from and positive messages from, whether it be as simple as a t-shirt. Um, with with this stately queen kind of figure, hi queenie. <laughs> um, but she has a, a safety pin in her lip, you know, which 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 speaks to like the she, this is this queenly you know kind of figure relating to the common grungy punk sitting in the back of some you know bar or what have you, you know, they can relate to this to this picture now. It's like, hey, she got a she got the same, you know, and it starts that conversation, starts that interaction. Um, but you know, my belief system is built on my faith I'm Muslim. Um, but my father always kept us my father and my mother always kept us finely tuned to all of the philosophies and religions and dogmas and doctrines of the world, whether it be Buddhism or, or Hinduism or or, or or Marxism or or Christianity or, or just you know the philosophy behind karate. You know, my father always made sure we stay in tune with that. Um, and so I, you know, I I give that out. You know, I, I emit that kind of energy. Um, and reading is books like. You know, I actually literally have the autobiography of Michael Max in my bag, along with George Orwell's Animal Farm, along with a book that I think everybody in the crowd should go get today, and it's called The, the, the Next American Revolution. It's written by Gracie Lee Boggs, and uh, she's, a, she's a, a, a woman who's been through every single struggle in the, in the history of the United States since, like, World War, from the end of World War I, right? And she's based in Detroit. You know, this, the, the, the city that I am most afraid of to go to, but, <laughs> but, but also the, the, city that, the city that is probably the most dilapidated in the U.S., but also at the same time the most ins inspiring about how they plan on rebuilding that place from the bottom up. So, you know, it, I read BBC News, Cryptagon.com, the conspiracy theories, the non-conspiracy theories. I read the, the, the Bible, I'll read the Quran, I'll read, you know, sacred Hindu texts, I'll read Trader Truth's album, liner notes, you know, it, it, it you know, I'll, I'll read everything, you know, everything has a story to tell. How do you see your career, the shift now from here on out? It, you know what I'm saying? Um, do you still see yourself having a viable career with this new out, you know, outlook on life? Do you believe your beliefs are going to, you know, hinder that? And is that even an issue with you now? Uh, that's the thing. I, I think I, I, I always believed what I believe, whether I live by those uh, principles or not. Um, I, I've always believed what I believe, and I think anybody would agree with me that knows Clip's music would, would you know, in, in my lyrics, I always made a reference to my faith. But the good thing about my faith is, you know, it, it teaches me it doesn't matter, 
you know, w what it means for me in this industry or, or, or where it puts me. You know, all I know is that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So whether I'm doing music, writing a book, or working at Jack in the Box, you know, I'm gonna be all right. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, I want to, Kwali, we speaking about faith, he's speaking about faith right now. Your music has incorporated a lot of religion um, overtones. You speak into traditional as well as non-traditional um, religious expression within and outside of hip hop's culture and African American culture. How vital is that in expressing who you are as an individual? <laughs> Um, I think it's the biggest question. Um, you know, it's more spiritual stuff that I, that I speak on um, uh, because I don't, I don't subscribe personally to, to any religion. Um, but, you know, I know God exists. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 my life experience tells me this. Um, so, I, you know, when I was growing up, I think that's the, that's the number one question. I think that's why religion, religious discussions and spiritual discussions I'm so heated because everybody wants to know. Um, I think it's a bit arrogant to think that we can know the vastness of, 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 of a God experience or whatever you call it. Um, and so I think it's, it's a, it's, it's, there's a certain amount of respect you have to have for it. Um, but we, we all talking about the same things. I feel like, you know, I, I, I truly feel like music in itself is a prayer. I feel like every time I go in the booth, every time I get on the stage is a prayer. Because this is I'm I'm using this gift that God has given me and I'm using it to, to change things and I'm using it to do things with and it's like that to me is, is an active real prayer. Um and so I I, I talk about that in, in the music. Um the same way I talk about worldly influences, the same way I talk about women and love, um but spirituality and uh, people's belief system and 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 the influence of God in my life is something that's very important in my music. It's right now in here, and you can go ahead and clap for him. So. I gotta remind me not to interrupt the clapping. Um, hearing Kwali speak about that, does does that to you say that you know the divide is not as big as we think, or do you think that just that fundamental idea that he has about not identifying? And identifying with any religion, will that always be a hindrance in secular hip hop and the Christian hip hop movement? I guess joining. Yeah, I see it happening more more nowadays than any. Than, I mean, just me being on the panel with you guys is evident of the discussions happening, um, collaborating with artists, uh, regardless of what faith they uh, they convey or believe, and and being willing to do that and still make a song that has a message to it. I mean, I wouldn't collaborate with any of these guys and say, hey, I want you to make sure you point them to Jesus if that's not where they are. Now, we may do an anti-drug song. We may, you know, do an anti-game song. But I, I would never do a song with an artist and say, hey, talk about Jesus and point them to Jesus if that's not where they're at. Because uh, that would send mixed messages to everybody that's listening. And I definitely don't want to lead the youth astray. Um, but I'm... I'm you know, as a Christian, we're saved by grace through faith. It's a faith walk. I, I'm not saved by grace through knowledge. I didn't, it's 2,000 years, over 2,000 years ago. I can't tell you where Jesus walked, exactly where he hung. Some people have, you know, speculated where it is in this. But at the end of the day, all of us, including you, have faith in something. And the question is, is where you're going to put your faith in. He believes there's a God. Um, so he's based his faith on everything that's shaped uh, his life, all the different things he, he reads. For me, I have faith that the Holy Bible is God's word and it's God's, it's God breathed. And so I place my faith in Jesus and I base it on the word, the Bible. That's my, that's my knowledge of God. That's my inspiration from God. That's how I know this God um, that I believe in. And so at the end of the day, it's where does our faith lie? And um, it takes faith to sit in that chair right there because you man made it and it could very well fall over, but you're exercising faith by getting it. And so, you know, I, I choose to, to, to believe that the Bible is um, 
God's word and, and that's where I based my Christianity off of. Answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And Trey, I know you're a person whose faith has come into play many times in his life as well as career. You have personal trials and tribulations as well as professional trials and tribulations. And you being from the hood and representing people that, you know, the people that we speak to and the people that we represent for a love is saying that we're living in hell. You know what I'm saying? Do you see, you know, times where you feel the need to use your music as a way of guiding people out of that hell? And do you feel the need to, to, to send them to, to God or to Christ or to any particular religion or just to better themselves personally? I, I would say with, with this kind of all the aspects that you just touched because it was crazy, like, believe it or not, every time I get ready to hit the stage, you know, through, I had to speak to the big homie and I let him know through this faith, I asked him to give me the strength to go out and touch others working through him, regardless if it may be a, a sign to give them hope that, that, that something can happen in their life, a sign just to even make their better than what it was, make their day better than what it was yesterday. Explain to them, you know, they don't really have the knowledge or understanding, but I think when you got cats like me and cats like you and, and Lupe and other ones reaching out, explain it to them, this is what this is, or, or it can be better, or it's always somebody going worse, you know, I tend to open them up a lot, so I most definitely feel obligated to do that. And Lou, um, every now and then I see you incorporating, you know, certain spiritual aspects, um, and they, they, they go across a wide range. Do you feel the need to speak across those ranges to reach different people, or is that just a representation of the different things and influences that you've had? Um, he always rubs that neck as soon as I ask him. So. You gotta get the, you gotta get this, the, the knowledge out. It's back here. <laughs> um, I, I try and, you know, I have, I have issues with religion, you know, because it, it's the, the practice of it, not where it came from, but the practice of it and the implementation of it, because it's so, it, it can separate so easily. You know, it can send people, it can, it can bring up those partitions so easy. Um, so what I try and do is I, I try and remove it, you know, or I try and make it universal, you know, and just focus on the universal principles that we all can agree on, you know, um, even to the point where I, I call it, <laughs> I call it the JCM Mafia. It's the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. Wow. <laughs> the JCM Mafia. And we all come from the same place. We all come from the Abrahamic tradition. You know, we all come from this one point. Um, and I focus on that. We can go into Hinduism and all these other, all these other religions and things of that nature, because um, there's similarities in all of them. But specifically, the, the Judaism, Christianity, and, and the Muslim faiths all come from the same place. They all, come, they all have the same stories, you know, the same principles, the same ideologies, even some of the same practices, from as barbaric as stoning someone to death for adultery, you know, to, you know, give, give to your fellow man, even if you're poor give to your fellow man, you know. So it's, I try and take these, the universal concepts that we all agree on or that we all share, no matter how barbaric, because I think that's important to focus on those things in religion because it, it, it addresses your level of humanity because you don't have to do that. You know, you don't have to be that barbaric. You don't have to be that violent. And I, I, I definitely speak, you know, to, to my Muslim brothers and sisters who practice martyrdom as far as suicide violence and things that they just speak directly to them because you know murder is wrong it's not it's, it's not islam you know but i say the same thing to christians you know that you shouldn't be bombed because those jet pilots and those stealth fighters are christian you know and i say the same thing to those jewish soldiers you know who shoot a 12 year old girl you know 16 times with automatic weapon you know that is barbaric you know and we can all share in the barbarity of our actions you know, and, and also let's share in the, in, the, in the grace and the glory of all our actions as well. Um, and sometimes to do that, you have to remove religion. You have to remove those titles and you just have to put focus on those acts. So in my music, when I sit down and I write songs, you know, I take religion out of it. It could be a Jewish man, it could be a Christian man, it could be a Hindu man, it could be, a, it, it could be a, an agnostic man, it could be a black man, white man, it could be an Eskimo. You know, you, you'd be surprised what the human, the human machine is capable of doing. You know, both for the, for the negative and for the positive. So I focus on that. You know, I focus on those labelless kind of things. Um, and even when you pull that out, there's there's even, you know, you pull those labels out. There's so much similarity. 
you know, that, that outweighs those differences, like you were saying before, that outweighs those things so crazy. There's, it's almost 99 to 1. There's, there's, there's more similarity just being human and experiencing and interact, interacting and communicating with each other just as human beings. You know, that is what I try and focus on in my music. And now it's not that you have this normal. See, I didn't wait for the clapping. I'm sorry, I was supposed to wait. <laughs> And now that you have this new outlook on life and this new... I'm calling it new, man. It I'm sorry. Uh, well, it's new to us, brother. I'm sorry. It's new to us, I guess. All right, all right. But yeah. now that you're expressing now to the world this outlook on life um, with your career and everything now, do you see yourself... Because I've asked this of Trey Nine, I've asked this of Vaughn Warren, and, uh, and to me, this is the integral question. Do you see yourself now... Do you still see yourself as Malice the Rapper? who now has this Christian, who, when they, who is now recognizing himself as a Christian, or do you see yourself as a Christian who now has to incorporate his rap life into his world? Um, right now, you know, since I'm on my author kick, you know, uh, I'm going by Gene Elliott Thornton Jr., you know. That's what my mama named me, so that's, that's right. what I'm going by. Um, I just want to say uh, real quick, that, that my faith, you know, and I love like my, my Muslim brothers, Jewish, all my Christian brothers. Um, I just wanna say, you know, my faith just doesn't allow me or afford me the, the luxury of being politically correct. Um, I, can't, I can't say that, you know, as long as we believe in something and, you know, everybody just all get along, that, you know, we're all gonna make it to heaven. The Bible, the Bible doesn't teach that if that's what you believe. But um, I think, you know, the, the beauty of it is that, you know, I, I don't have, everyone has their choice and you do have the right to choose. And I do believe that no one should, should force you in what to choose. The Bible also says it is not our job to convict anybody's heart. You know, one person will plant the seed, next person will come by and water it, and maybe eventually, you know, some people will get the picture. So I just wanna just say that and just, and just be very clear that, you know, I just, I don't believe it's just everybody just believe in something. I don't, I don't believe that. That. Powerful. Um, again, I want to thank all our panelists here that came in today. If you guys can again give a round of applause to our panelists here. Jurgis Joseph, I'm born right here in East Texas, born and raised. Uh, I got a question about all the, the propaganda about like folks selling their souls by superstars, and it seems like they only talk about the black superstars. Let's, let's, let's just be, I'm going to cut you off. Let's be real, you're talking about the Illuminati. Yeah, yeah. So let's not say yeah. propaganda. Yeah. Even though that's what it is, let's just say what it is. Well, yeah, oh, yeah. It's about the Illuminati. And so I want to know, is it just propaganda or is it... I, I already know folks ain't going in no room and saying, all right, you got to do this to me and you got to sign your soul to the devil. What's really happening? If that ain't what's happening, what's really happening? How is folks... I believe folks selling their soul. You can sell your soul for doing something wrong. You give your soul away. What, what's really happening? As a, as a man and as a Christian, I can say that if something like Illuminati exists, I haven't seen it, and I'm probably they probably don't want me in it because I believe in God. Um, that being said, um, what's really happening is hard work. What's really happening is hustle and grind. Now, are there people richer than us that sit around and discuss things that we have no control over? Yes. Do they invite rappers in the room? No. I'm just gonna be real, and I don't care about how rich you are. The richest rappers I know, Puffy, Puffy gets checks from people. Jay-Z's rich, he still gets his checks from people. We do not control enough of something to be allowed into. If there is such a thing as this inner circle, I can almost guarantee you that there are no people of color in that inner circle. And if there are, they are not from they're not from Houston, they're not from the South Side, they're not from Port Arthur, Texas, they're not from the East Side of Chicago, they're not from Virginia, they're not from Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? And I don't want to start saying that they're from whatever city, but 
if something like that exists, because I don't know about I can't say what all happens in the world and what doesn't all go on. But if it is, I haven't seen it, they ain't let me in it, and I wouldn't want to be in it if it was. And I appreciate that. All right, um, my name is uh, Little Roddy, and I am a uh, Christian rapper. Um, I'm one of those that, you know, I, I straight up believe that, you know, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. But I also feel that, and this, this question is towards Malice. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you, brother, for making that decision. You know, I'm very, very proud of you, bro. Um, Appreciate it. But with that being said, when the scriptures say that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, mm. and that no man can go into the Father but through him, um, share your thoughts as far as where you're at and where you see your career has been. Um, and how important is that? How important is it to you to convey that message now that you're a Christian? Uh, how, how important is it to you to, you to convey that message? I mean, I, th I think you can see it's, it's not easy, you know, to, to sit up here and, and to say what I believe. You know, um, it's not easy, it's, it's, it's not popular, and it's definitely not convenient. But, you know, it, it's what I have to do, you know, and it's what I'm going to do. And it's the fear of God, definitely. All right. From Texas, um, Talib, you mentioned that uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X was one of the biggest books that changed your life, and Lupe said he even, have, he even has a copy in his backpack. I was wondering just specifically how it um, changed y'all's lives. Well, I think it, it's the it's the it's a book that got me to really love reading, as opposed to just reading for school. Because the stuff he's talked about, especially in the first half of the book, you know, I had never seen in an academic setting. And it, it just really intrigued me. But the halfway through the book, the transformation point, and the, the passion that Malcolm Little, during the Malcolm X, had for his people, and the, um, the sort of uh, sort of revelation he had, sort of vision he had, um, just was very impressive to me as a 14 year old. And that's, that's when I read it. Um, I, I honestly think it's one of the greatest American stories. When you talk about the legacy of America, um, you know, as, as, as evil and as foul as America can be and is being and has been, you know, there's, there's, there's a beauty that comes out of uh, people who grow up here. And, 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 you know, Malcolm X, his transformation from, from the hood to the nation of Islam, to embracing Islam as a whole after he went to Mecca, to him being a pan-Africanist and understanding the connection of African people throughout the, the, the diaspora. I think he's our, he's our shining prince, and he's the, one of the greatest exam, examples of a man that, that we can look to and say, you know what, I could be better. That's right, that's right. Well, he is obligated to God. And so, you know, these people are probably not going to want to put themselves out there. I don't think there is such a thing as a safe record. You know, quite honestly, if, you're, if your message is Christianity, I think you kind of, I think that's kind of what it was. You have to be Christ-like and you have to be willing to, and I'm not a Christian rapper, I'm just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian and I, rap is my job, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's just kind of how I see it. You know what I'm saying? Maybe other people may look at it different, but I think you have to be careful with the definitions of safe and controversial because that's really all dependent on the world you live in. Uh, just to add on it, I think that the I think the, the Bible is very controversial. You know, I think that I think all the holy books were controversial, but the Bible specifically, you had violence, you had sex, you had murder, you had Balling, you had ballers. Pharaoh was the biggest baller of all time. You know, you had you had Jesus losing his cool and flipping over the money changers desk. You know, like it wasn't it wasn't a a polished, safe kind of wishy washy, everybody love each other kind of situation because the Romans definitely did not love Jesus, right? You know, so you had blood, guts, gore, the whole situation. Um, so at the same time, too, I think you know, hip hip hop is a baby in the game when it comes to controversy. You know, I think, actually, I don't think we're controversial enough, to be honest with you, you know?
situations and they have to deal with that. Um, but what other ways besides your book and uh, besides your music without compromising your art, art form can you reach kids and let them know that, hey, you know, you just need to enjoy it and not emulate it and not try to be that? Like, what other ways can you do that? You mean, what other ways do I personally do that? Well, or just, just in general. Well, just in general, how can hip hop reach the kids? And, and this is a question for any one of the panelists, but just how can how can you let kids know that just enjoy it, just enjoy it as an art form, and that's all it is. Well, I mean, I can say this: I, I don't really see any kids in here right now, but you know, I, I lend myself to my community, um, detention homes, boys' homes, you know. Um, my wife has a girls group called Sisters Keeper that, that meets at my house uh, twice a month. And uh, I think just lending yourself and, 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 and mentoring and just speaking, you know, and, and, and telling the truth. It's really not that big of a magic trick, you know, to do something like that. And that, you know, goes a long way, just talking. And I think it's also, you know, you have to, I think you have to talk to them. I mean, I think that's it. I mean, I think the problem is, is that we haven't, as a hip hop as a community, haven't given you guys enough opportunities to really see us as people. And the only perception that many of you have of us is basically whatever that, whatever conclusion you draw from our music. And that may be the right conclusion, or sometimes it may be the wrong conclusion. And if I don't get out there personally to speak to these type of things, then all people will have is the conclusion that they've drawn. So I think specifically for the kids, you know, it's important that we speak to them and, you know, we go out in the community and we talk to these kids because they're the main ones who are getting um, the mixed messages from what we're saying. Okay, I've kind of came to a set that a grown man who can't change, he's going to have to work that out with God. The best thing that can happen is guys like Trey Bunn who profess to be Christians yet their music is a career, is that they could get before young people and say, look, this is my paycheck, that's not my lifestyle, um, I don't live that life, I have a wife, I have kids. A few high schools um, have a panel so kids can be educated on the truth. Uh, you won't find many rappers willing to do that because it almost ruins their, their street cred or you know the image they're trying to portray in their music. Denzel Washington, he could be an actor, play a father, a preacher, and uh, never changes, it stays the same. Even if they put one God song or one positive song on their record, it, it, the rest of them just overshadow it. So I think, as Bunt said, rappers have a responsibility to the youth to make it clear, this is my acting role, don't believe it, don't do it, don't pack a gun, there's consequences, don't sell drugs, there's consequences, and, and, and that would help tremendously. Um, and that's a middle ground that I believe we can meet, meet at. Born and raised in Houston. And um, my question is, in class we're taught about kind of conversion experiences. So people have these religious conversions and a lot of you alluded to kind of a developing maturity level that influenced um, your art and the way you decided to um, produce it and perceive it. So I was just wondering if any of you kind of had maybe a profound experience where you decided you had to be honest with the music <laughs> or <laughs> um, anything just in, in general about where your honesty came and it was a real conversion. Yes, um, and it's all documented in my book, Wretched Pitiful, <laughs> Poor Blind and Naked. And it's in the back, you can pick one up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> How you doing? I'm uh, my name is Roderick. I'm an aspiring rapper out of Houston. And uh, my question is, with religion and hip hop, why does it have to be so defined as if if you're a Christian, you have to just basically do straight? I'm Christian and I'm doing I'm doing I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Like. You're still a regular person. When you leave, your station ain't always on the Christian station. Your TV ain't always on the Christian station. You still go to the store, you still go to the red box and let you a movie. You know, you, you still do regular things, you know. And uh, they, they, I heard somebody say, I, I got here a little late, but I heard y'all say, 
uh, you know, Christian hip hop would like, would like be safe or something, you know. Jesus wasn't safe. He he came and shook up everything and they killed him. He got killed for it. You know? And I, I say if you rap, you should be able to rap about anything and they should be able to see, oh, he Christian. You know, because you don't have to say you're a Christian, they should just be able to see. Just like you Trill OG. I see Trill OG <laughs> sitting in the chair. You know? That, that's how I see I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, do you have a question? No, I, I asked a question. The question was, why is it that people believe that if you're a Christian rapper or if you're a Christian and you rap, that you have to be so, like, I'm, I'm doing this song and it's going to do this. You have to do praise and worship on a song. And, you know, you, why, why does it have to be so defined like that? Why you can't just be a regular person that people just see? Oh, he's a Christian. I mean, I, 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 don't, I personally don't think that people think like that. You know, I don't think people look at it like that at all. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's, it's more of a result of coming late to the panel because there's a lot of experiences that was discussed that led to some of the statements that you heard. Um, me, because I rap, my name is Talib Kweli. People, be, because I'm in a group with a Muslim rapper, most deaf, people assume I'm Muslim. You know, they hear the name Talib, which is an Arabic Muslim name. They, and they hear, they hear me reference stuff that they might have heard in the Quran. And they, they, because I've read it, and they, they think I'm Muslim. They hear me talk about stuff that they might heard in the Bible. People hit me on Twitter all the time, like, thank you for becoming a Christian. You know what I'm saying? Like, people, people take what it is that they get from, from, and music, everybody hears a song different. Um, and I think, you know, uh, with, with Trey Rupna was saying earlier about him saying, declaring himself to be a Christian artist was, that in itself was a revelation because it was like, it was like, okay, I'm saying this, but I'm saying this because I'm trying to, it's, it's a means to an end. I'm trying to make sure that I reach other Christians and other people I'm trying to reach, or people who are not even Christian. I'm trying to, uh, you know, spread the gospel. Um, and I think it was very important when he made a point early, I don't know if you heard it, about him making an album and respecting the art, like what you said. You know what I'm saying? Like, he said, I'm a Christian rapper, but I'm gonna make songs about the sun, about going to the park, about whatever I wanna make a song about. Every song will have to, have to be a statement of a principle, you know what I'm saying? And I think that the truest artists do a great job at that. And I, and I, I personally, the same way that I was happy when Jay-Z retired, I was, I, was, I was excited the first time, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, was, I was excited to see what he would rap about once he don't have to put out an album to bring up the fourth quarter sales for his label. You know what I'm saying? What's, as an as a artist, what's he gonna talk about? And I'm excited to hear what Malice is gonna talk about now when, when and if he just decides to make more music, like what that music is gonna sound like. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm commissioned to go and make disciples. If, if, if I say anybody I'm Christian, you know, pick up my album, and you hear me say, drop to your knees, ho, and do what you do. Um, I think my Christianity just went out the window and I can't be an effective witness. But see, you, wouldn't say, you wouldn't say that though, right? Like, no, you, I wouldn't. But so they would see you're a Christian. But, your but question, you didn't have to say it. But your question is, can my content and music be anything? Can my content and music be anything and just live out the Christian life? No, because by our words we're acquitted and by our words we're condemned. You know, And I was going to point out that uh, Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Proverbs 18.21, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 4.24, Keep your mouth from perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. So if I'm saying I believe the Bible, the Bible is true with you. The Bible is true. Then I have to live and die by that, or else I become a hypocrite, and we have enough of that. Hi, my name is David Gasco, and uh, thanks all for coming. It's been awesome. But uh, I guess my question is for Trey and Lupe. Um, so, are some questions? Uh, my question, no, just one, just one. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, Y'all did a song a little while ago. It's a great song, um, Bad Done Seems So Wrong. And um, I guess for those that don't know, it's basically a song about how uh, when you're in a bad situation, you know, bad decisions uh, can seem a lot more appealing. Um, I guess my question is, do you feel, you know, in the context of that song and maybe more generally, um, too, do you feel 
sort of an ethical responsibility to, um, you know, in your music to steer people away from, you know, making those kinds of bad decisions? Or do you think it's really more about just shining a light on, you know, what happens? I mean, we came, as far as my standpoint with the song, I came more so kind of what I was touching on earlier to shit like that. It's always something worse than, than what you may be experiencing. Like, we complain about little things. We may complain about what we got in the refrigerator. We might not want to eat that thing. There's some people out here that don't have nothing, you know what I'm saying? So my standpoint was with it is the bad don't seem so wrong. I, what we complain about is so bad is us. When I go to Outlook and, and, and learn the story of the next man, my situation might be a cakewalk compared to that man. So that was my standpoint from the song. Um, just to take it non-specific away from the song, just in general, um, you know, always, it, it's, it's a, I walk a line. I walk the line of I don't want to I don't want to tell you what to do, you know, because who am I to tell you what to do, you know? From all my intelligence and everything I learned and life experiences, you've had the same, so you probably more credited and better off telling me what to do. Um, so in my music, the responsibility that I take upon myself is I try and I definitely have a line for positivity, you know, um, but I don't try and push it too hard. You know, I don't try and I don't put it to the point where these are instructions for you to live your life. There's other way greater things that I think you can use to do that. You know, and really it's your own life. You decide what you want to do for yourself. Um, but at, at the same time too, I try and tell that, that story or, or push that imagery or shed that light on characters that you wouldn't assume felt that way. You know, so even me just jumping on the song Betray it, it's like on image wise, we pull the opposites. You know, he's way taller than I am. <laughs> Chain is way heavier than mine. You know? But it, it's those juxtapositions that I try and create so you can, so you know, people can lose, you know, get get, get the, the, the false perceptions out of their head, you know, get those those assumptions and those, those, those things out of the way so you can see like, oh, I can relate to that story. You know, I can relate to what he said. You look at the look at the triangle that's being formed right now. You got nerdy little me, nerdy little you, and thuggy old man. <laughs> Discussing, you know, bad those things are wrong, you know. So it it is it, it's definitely it definitely has a point and a purpose, and we do it for a reason. We don't do it for nothing. We definitely do it to have some effect out there in the world, you know. But at the same time, too, you know, it, it's up for you to take it from there and live your life how you, how you choose. Thank you. Uh, how y'all doing? Everybody good? Uh, yes. What's happening? Yeah. What's happening? <laughs> My name is Gifted the Flame. I'm uh, from New Orleans. And I'm also an artist. And um, my question, because you know, you guys are on another level. You know, one, looking at you, like pot, you know what I'm saying? Malice, Trey Lupe, Tali, Trey got love for all y'all. My question is, by y'all being involved in hip hop, everybody up here know a big thing about rap is to be real. So when I look at my city, we never had games. But now when I go home, everybody bloods. And I think we all understand why that is. Um, we can't deny the power that hip hop has. You know, so as an artist, when you sit down writing the lyrics, I have six kids. I wonder, do your kids run through your head? You know, like Trey, for you, for instance, when you pen your lyrics, I know you're a lot of your personal testimony just from, you know, hearing your interviews and things of that sort. When you pen your lyrics, does it ever cross your head that by me running this advertisement on this song, would have convinced this little kid and this little chick to do something that I know is gonna destroy his or her life. I, I think with me, like, like I say, the reason that I, I, I do the music that I do is because I choose to tell it from my standpoint of, of, of my experiences, and at the same time as be speaking my experiences, I tend to let them know the outcome, you know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, I, I feel like it's on me to at least speak on my behalf of, of, of what I've experienced or what I've seen and what I've seen the outcome be. Now, I can sit there and tell them whatever, whatever you may feel I need to tell them or the next person may feel I need to tell them, they're gonna take to what they wanna take to. So I just choose to just be blunt truthful with them, you know? 
And I understand, you know, like, I, I don't keep, as far as my kids, I don't keep my music here for them because I feel I, I want them to know this is what's this. I want them to know the struggles I went through. I want them to know what came about with their uncle or, or both of their aunties who passed. Like, I, I want them to know a different stuff they're going, so they'll soak their knowledge in. And I feel, honestly, the way that I do it, I feel that they're going to be smart enough to make their own decision. Decide which path you wanted to go. You know, with him, he he had no mom, he had no daddy, he had nobody to talk to. He just did what he felt he needed to do. So that's why I choose to keep my music out. Is I, I feel I'm not, I don't have any intention on changing anytime soon because I feel it's still not that need to be spoken. On the, on the, I just on on one to know I pass the bun. Beyond, cause I spoke on it. I got a lyric where I say, look, we can make love like. Snoop, like Pablo made drugs, like Snoop Dogg made cubs, like Lil Wayne made bloods, right? But as opposed to me going after them, let's talk about the circumstances where those young men are even in a situation where they, it's, they so reactive enough that once they hear a song, they immediately turn to a blood. There's something going on in that situation. In New Orleans, I know New Orleans like, like this. Right? Or we can go plant this God, you know, or we can go paint this school, you know, or we can just leave New Orleans, you know, we can go to Baton Rouge, or we can go down to the Bayou, we, you know, it's something else that we could be doing other than you being stagnant to where you even heard that song, you know? That's right. And I just, I just want to say one thing, this gives me an opportunity to say something I've been wanting to say for a long time, because he made a comment about, you know, do the kids, do little kids run through our minds as we write our songs? Well, I'm a parent. Little kids run through my house while I write my songs. And I don't feel that it's Malice, Lupe, Trey, Trey Nine, or Tyler Quali's responsibility to raise my children. It is my responsibility to raise my children. It is my responsibility to instill an idea and sense of the world so that when they come into contact with things that they may not understand, that they come back to me. That's right. Or they go to the Bible. I tell them, if you, don't, if you can't get to me, go to God. That's what I teach my kids. Now, I'm a very grown man. I make my music for grown people. And even grown people don't understand everything I say in my music. So of course children are gonna misinterpret what they see and what they hear. Our job as a community, that's why I say our, our job as a community is to make sure that when we see children in our lives, and not necessarily in our lives, that are misinterpreting things that they may have seen. And keep in mind, you don't have to listen to rap to, see, to hear curses, especially if you live in the projects. Because when I grew up in 73, there was no rap music. But they listened to the Isley Brothers and and blues records and Zydeco and cuss like sailors and drank and smoke. Everything that they try to attribute to the hip hop lifestyle already existed before hip hop came to be. <laughs> Being a parent existed before hip hop came to be. So before any of these musical or cultural obligations come into play for me, my family comes into play first. So yes, I do think about the kids when I write my rhymes. I think about my kids, and I don't expect you to raise my children, and I don't think you should expect me to raise your children. Good evening, gentlemen. My, gentlemen, my name is Michael Fuller. Um, I just graduated from Hampton University uh, last May. Um, uh, and I just downloaded your brother's uh, mixtape, Fear of God, uh, which brings me to my question, do you believe that hip hop is becoming a new religion? Um, and I ask that because um, the, the younger generation, um, they're straying away from the church, but they're listening to you guys' music 24-7 all day, and, you know, that's, and that's what they're learning, and that's, you know, that's all they're seeing. Um, but basically, that's, that's pretty much my question. Do you believe that hip-hop I mean, becoming a new? I, I do believe that hip-hop could be the next church. Um, I definitely believe that, you know, as, as an artist and, and you know, the things that I'm doing, the things that, that Fun is doing as well, you know, I, I do see it like it's possible to, to, to take that change or to go in that avenue, but not just hip hop, I think every avenue should be able to, you know, uplift the child and point him in the direction of God. 
My name is uh, Professional. I have a question for Trey Nine and Bun. Um, do y'all believe that, on y'all beliefs, do y'all believe that we're fighting against amongst each other, blacks against blacks, brown against browns, or are we fighting a spirit, above the spiritual realm, a spiritual warfare? It's, it's always been spiritual. And, you know, I can say that as a person, you know what I'm saying? In spite of what I do for a living, you know what I'm saying, who I entertain, the songs I make, every day is a fight for my soul. It's a fight for everybody in this room every day, regardless of who they are and what they do. Um, I do feel, you know, sometimes where it's, it's easier for me and it's harder for me, you know? Um, but it's, it's an obligation that I feel as a Christian. Now, am I the most upstanding Christian on God's planet? Probably not. But I haven't met a Christian yet that wasn't a work in progress. So um, that, that's just me. I'm, I'm just a betrayer. Yeah, I think it's clear that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and rulers and authorities in the air that we don't see. And that's why you know, I've came to the understanding that my fight, my battle is not against any one person. Um, I've seen rappers who um, spit the same um, material you might hear from Trey or Bun, and I can kick it with them because ultimately my goal is to show them a way, you know. Um, and I've seen them turn around and make an album that wasn't Christian but wasn't glorifying um, you know, evil behavior wasn't glorifying it, but was keeping it clean, and uh, and and watch that at work. I think when these, when a lot of rappers sit down and write their rhymes, there's influences that are that are in this world that exist that influence them to write that. Um, I don't believe it's flesh and blood writing that rhyme. There's an influence. It could have been spirit and spirits and principalities at work long before that latched onto them as children. You don't have that responsibility to raise these kids because in actuality, you guys are. Because dad's not home anymore. Mom's working two or three jobs and she just doesn't have the opportunity to truly raise these kids. So they're watching and listening to you guys and the gold chains and, the, and all that stuff. And so it's hard to, to try to influence this kid with 46 minutes in class and then they go home and they listen to your album for the rest of the night. And it's hard to kind of battle that and get them to understand that you know, once you get tats and grills and all that kind of stuff, sometimes they're kidding hurt your future if you're not going to be a rapper or an athlete and that kind of deal. And so do you think, ever think there's a time when I guess you rappers will come together and, and give a positive message and get these kids going because you're watching these kids, you guys go do outreach programs and things like that, but it's kind of like you're spinning your wheels because the same thing you're trying to battle against and say, hey, don't do this, you're talking about it in your album. So it's hard to say, because kids won't always listen to what you say, they will watch what you do. And so it's hard to kind of fight that balance. Do you find a time where you think rappers will become a positive message to where they're not just talking about the detriment and the, and the, the bad things that happen to you in the album? You know what I mean? Like in your neighborhood. Well, I think, I think, I think the, the problem is, is that, I think, you know, while they said it earlier, is that, you know, we as artists, we're not obligated to do that. It's only if we personally feel the obligation to do that. You know, if you go to McDonald's and, if, and you know, the person behind the counter they're not obligated to tell you how bad McDonald's is. Their only obligation at work is to sell you McDonald's. Now, me as a person, I personally know that there are other things going on. So when I'm not at work, I go out in the community and I try to do what I can to rectify that. But that being said, we again, we go back to the point that if a child is at home listening to me at night, where's the parents? You know what I'm saying? I understand that. I'm, I was a last key kid, my brother, and look where I'm at. I'm, I'm a professor, co-professor at Cuban at Rice University, and I was raised on hip hop. I was raised on Ice Cube and all of these things. I came home from school at four o'clock, my mother was gone. You know what I'm saying? I made some good decisions and I made some bad decisions. I listened to what some things my friends said, and in other decisions I thought about what my mother said, and I made those decisions. As a person in my community, I try to speak into people's lives. But you can't hold me or hip hop accountable for the fact that a person hears what I said and chooses to do it. And specifically a child. 
Now, when I say that it's not my responsibility to raise your child, I meant that primarily. Now, does it take a village to raise a child? Yes, it does. But you got to stand up and point at all the things that are creating these circumstances. You got to point to the government just as much as the rap. You know what I'm saying? And I think that it's not true that rappers don't get together and send messages about positivity. Rappers do it all the time. Nobody focuses on it. It's the problem because, you know, if, if we make a statement about our political beliefs about what's going on in the community, well, Radio One may not be able to play that because we may be speaking from something that may be viewed as a liberal, a liberal point of view. And the people that own the radio stations are conservative. So they're not gonna play those records. And vice versa. We fight daily. And I, I think don't, most people don't know this. We fight daily to get certain things accepted um, by record labels and by radio stations. And it's not always sex or person content. We try to bring up like, you know, Lupe said it's certain people's names and things that he's trying to address. And even though they agree with him, they can't support him. Because the powers that be that own these outlets disagree with him. So then Lupe has to find other outlets to let the people know how he feels. And we do have these things. The internet has leveled the playing field. So we have people now like a Lupe who can release an album that doesn't have singles getting major radio play and still debut number one in the country, selling over 200,000 copies in one week because people that want to know will make a search. Hip hop is not giving up on our children. Hip hop is getting older and we're, ra we're, we're having children, we're raising children. So we understand the stakes. And believe me, even though you're a rapper and you may have made it out of the hood, you get a nice house, issues are still there. The same issues that are affecting the inner city, whether people want to believe them or not, are affecting the suburbs as well. They're losing the grip on their children just like we are. And they're not listening to hip hop primarily. So we've got to look at society as a whole and say, what are all the conditions that are, like, that are coming together that are helping to take away um, the importance of morals and standards in our community and address them all? Now, we as hip hop artists are willing to stand up and address it, but I don't see Hollywood I don't see the liquor companies, I don't see tobacco companies, I don't see any of these people willing to stand up and talk about it. You know what I'm saying? At least we're willing to talk about it and have this conversation. And we're, keep in mind, we're still young. Rap is the youngest musical art form out there. Rock, R&B, all these other forms have been out there with years to express themselves. And the same way that, you know, you may look at us and objectify us, well, they objectify jazz. They objectified R&B, blues artists, all these different people. But then when that entire scope of their lives and their careers were put into context and people really got to look at them, they realized that their good may have outweighed what we perceived as bad and we acknowledge them as leaders and legends in our community. And so for me, I'll bite that bullet now today for those that don't understand to get my, you know, and be appreciated maybe 10, 20 years down the line. It's okay if the teachers don't understand what we do right now. And we understand that, we, trust me, there's a rapper up here that wants a kid 12 years old to go out and commit a crime, smoke weed, drink, liquor, fight, none of that. But we all have to work towards it. And who's to say that your voice as a teacher is louder than mine as a rapper just because I'm on the radio? That's, that's a big, that's a misconception because you're telling me, here's what you're telling me. You're telling me that you can sit in the classroom for seven hours and talk to your child and that a three minute song can, can erase that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe that before that child got in your classroom, there was an issue. Okay, well let's speak to those issues and then once we, once we get rid of these issues, then we can talk about rap. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, rap is not here saying that we didn't do it. Rap is saying we're not alone. Just to keep me concise, I was principal for a day at a school, right? Now, but wait, 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 wait. Well, hold on, let me finish. It was the school I went to as a kid, right? It's on the west side of Chicago. Now keep in mind, you're a teacher, right? Kids from your school to do what? The kids will come into this school to eat. To eat. Not to learn. To eat breakfast and lunch. The principal of the school was trying to institute, now this is me talking to the principal the other day. He's trying to institute a third meal. 
So he know when them kids go home, they ain't gonna have nothing to eat when they go home if they come to school to eat, right? I'm in the school, Lupe Fiasco, Chi-Town, this is in Chicago. None of the kids knew who I was. And I was on the radio every day. None of these kids knew who I was and the problems that they had still existed, right? So they didn't know who the group, that's very important for you to understand. The kids that I was principal for a day at didn't even know who I was. And the issues still existed. They weren't coming to school to learn. They were coming to school to eat. Right? So that's some very serious problems, even within your school system itself, sir. Like the school system is very much to blame. You know, the education that you did you that hey, you you're, you're, the way you were taught how to teach kids and the systems that you came up under are very archaic and ancient. 60, 70 years past their time. Right? So you should go into school and take all those antiquated textbooks and those meaningless texts, meaningless texts, say that viscerally, meaningless texts, right? That you sit over and watch these kids take, you know that they're not gonna use 95% of that information at all, right? You know that. But parent teacher conference, you need to come talk to Jerome because he's being such and such. Or you need to do this, you're gonna give you an F for that, that. Throw away all them books, I challenge you. Throw away all them books. Throw away all of them. All the tests, everything, right? And teach them kids something meaningful. Teach them how to grow a plant, right? Teach them how to grow a plant. Teach them something meaningful, right? In their lives that they can do it themselves. As opposed to just going in there and teaching them this English, which they ain't never gonna use, or teaching them this math that they're never gonna use, or teaching them this history that's backwards that they're never gonna use. Right? So that's all. We equal now. You just as guilty. You just as guilty as no way. Mis miseducation is miseducation, no matter how you put it, whether it's coming through a radio station or it's coming out of a book or a teacher. Right? Miseducation. Miseducation is miseducation no matter who's saying it. That's because I can make it rhyme, right? And you can't, that don't make you better than me, Penny. 